I met Mr. Gibson after uh, having a few drinks and going over to a reading of his. I asked him what on earth he was listening to when he wrote this. And he said he was, he was the sweetest guy, I'm telling you. His response was, uh, oh, you'd be disappointed. But I insisted, I really wanted to know. And he just said he wanted to write something that read the way that David Bowie's Diamond Dogs sounded. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Oh yeah. This is one of the first reviews I ever did for the show. I deleted it long ago because it was terrible, but I vowed to redo it one day and that day has come. Today is Neuromancer, the classic seminal science fiction cyberpunk magnum opus of the American, now Canadian author William Gibson, originally published in 1984. His first novel, this version is spectacular. Look at this cover. Amazing mid-late 90s hacker shtick. You can just hear Sandstorm playing. He wrote it when he was around my age, about like 34, somewhere between 34 and 36. We very much live now, today, in a William Gibsonian landscape. Gibson was one of the first to come up with an idea of what we now so take for granted. It's integrated into the fabric of our daily existence. You know, it's, it's the water to us fish, right? Uh, it's absolutely invisible. The internet. Cyberspace. His short story, Burning Chrome, was where he invented the term. And that's also the title of a collection of his stories that he wrote prior to Neuromancer. The construction of this review was done using the very tool that this book prophesied and helped shape. You're using it to watch this. Gibson occupies the very unique position as an author of being a writer who lives in the future that he himself prophesied and designed, right? Helped to design, helped facilitate. And so it's surreal as hell, I can't even imagine, right? To watch the world change because you wrote a book. Many things turned out different, but he got close enough so that the result is uncanny, to say the least. Check out the documentary I've linked below, No Maps for These Territories, which informed this review. It's just a, an interview with William Gibson riding in the back of a car smoking cigarettes. It's perfect. <laughs> he has this reputation now, which he doesn't he doesn't enjoy, and I can I can certainly see why, of, of kind of being a, uh, yeah, a prophet, like a techno-prophet, like a sage, like sort of like, I mean, but, you know, his, one of his famous quotes is, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed, or it's something like that, I might be paraphrasing. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a strange slot to be placed in, and, uh, you know, that can be really frustrating, but, he, and his fiction has changed tremendously with time, Really what it is, is you can see, you read this and then you read something like um, Pattern Recognition from 2002, I think. Uh, it's so stripped down and minimalist and he really kind of pushed that whole trend, I think. He kind of pushed this futurist, minimalist aesthetic. Very much, you know, what Steve Jobs seemed to have kind of picked up on and ran with in a lot of fashion companies, right? In fact, uh, I think my friend Eric told me that uh, Gibson has his own, or he collaborated with Buzz Rickson in Japan. There's like some sort of like fashion line from William Gibson that's uh, that's uh, like uh, these uh, very sleek bomber, black bomber jackets, right? Which I think you can purchase on eBay. They're several hundred dollars though, excuse me. <clears throat> I think they're quite pricey though. Probably worth it. Henry Dorset Case, known by his surname in the novel, Case, is one of the most exhausted protagonists I've ever come across in literature. Right up there with like the sweaty collapse of Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment, or the bewildered, psychologically drawn and quartered Shakespearean Dane Hamlet. Everywhere in this world, in this novel, is description of Case's muscular, spinal, mental, and physical fatigue. Addled, ailing, disillusioned, not defeated, but damned close. He's broken. He's not a good man. He lives inside a cocoon, of self-medicated pain and self-loathing. It's very much a 21st century novel. His drug addiction, his abysmal depression, his failure and lost love, everything is pointing towards a grim and inevitable fate, toward a probable suicide. Speaking of addiction, depression, and suicide, this is a very relevant novel, I feel. Technology is enlarging the uh, divide between the haves and have-nots. Everybody's depressed. Many people across America are depressed. They are uh, facing challenging times economically, socially, uh, mentally whether because of the aforementioned or otherwise. We have international geopolitical conflicts that are adding to everybody's anxiety. We have rising costs because of ridiculous inflation. 
that it is just making everything exact that is exacerbating everything it is a really rough time we have increased deaths of despair we have increased mental illness we have basically it's a catastrophe out here in the 21st century and uh you know william gibson kind of predicted a lot of this unfortunately he, he sort of those are what his worlds look like right high highs and low lows and everywhere in this future culture technology being this omnipresent factor right but it is a really hard time out there no matter who you are i get it if anybody out there needs some validation yes it's bad it's very bad indeed it's very hard it's very very hard out there in america in the west to um stay afloat right so we need tools for taking care of ourselves right some of my favorites are eating properly getting enough sleep for sure really that's like the most important but you know exercising whatever that is 10,000 steps a day is great weightlifting running crossfit whatever you like walking is really good for riders by the way Another method is therapy, which is why I'd like to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make finding therapy more affordable and accessible, which is helpful because finding a therapist could be potentially difficult given the slim options in your area. If you live somewhere rural or out in the country, which admittedly does sound very nice these days. However, yeah, if you're looking to find a therapist, especially one that you really get along with, could be potentially difficult. But this is why BetterHelp is helpful, because you can go anywhere in the world, and as long as you have access to an internet connection, as long as you can jack into the matrix, as it were, you have access to your therapist. And they make finding a therapist easy, because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions online, BetterHelp can match you with a therapist in as little as just a few days. And it's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link below in the description. It's betterhelp.com forward slash BTF. Clicking on that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month. So you can check them out and see if it helps you. And I sincerely hope it does. And because finding the right therapist is a little bit like dating, if you don't initially fit with your therapist, which is a common thing in therapy, you can switch to a new therapist anytime at no additional cost, without having to worry about health insurance or who's in your network or anything like that. No worries there. Thank God. Am I right? So if you're struggling right now, and let's face it, who isn't? Please consider online therapy with BetterHelp. And thanks again to BetterHelp for supporting this channel. So in the book, you know, this, um, this cyberspace, this, uh, this uh, world, basically, this reality, the alternate reality, the digital one, is uh, referred to as The Matrix, right? And yes, he was a direct influence on the film. It would not exist without him. It would not exist without Neuromancer. The, the Matrix is nearly an adaptation. It's more of an homage, of course. There's a, you know, it has its own narrative, but, uh, and in some ways, honestly, The Matrix film is a better narrative, but uh, this, this is uh, the blueprint. Interestingly, as, as Gibson puts it, you know, compared to what he, uh, he, he speculated, today's internet is uh, utterly banal, to use the phrase he coined in this uh, NPR interview I've linked below. It's funny. I mean, he, he pictured this very, you know, sexy, uh, shadowy, mysterious, cool place. He thought it would be something cool, but I, I think he feels it really just turned into something stupid. Impressive, but uh, dumb at the same time. His version is certainly cooler in many ways far more physically interactive, far more appealing to the five senses. So yeah, Neuromancer is Gibson's first novel, a techno-noir thriller, right? Like Raymond Chandler having a drink with William S. Burroughs and J.G. Ballard in a downtown Tokyo dive bar with Joy Division playing on the jukebox. The book's origins lie in detective noir novels just as much as beat fiction. It's almost an homage to Chandler's The Big Sleep, essentially borrowing the same basic plot outline. Even he, in the documentary below, you know, somebody reads back the the first line to him, and he says it sounds like a Chandler book. But from there, Gibson layers on a strange web of modern computer poetry. So yeah, this is the story of Case, an addict and ex-hacker down on his luck, who inhabits a shady district in Chiba City near Tokyo. You can get any kind of operation you need there, right? And it always seems to be night. We're introduced to him in the beginning at his local watering hole in a bar called uh, The Gentleman Loser. The bartender Rats has a mechanical arm, like this, uh, you know, this cyborg arm, encased in shitty pink plastic. It's atmospherically equivalent to uh, Blade Runner, which came out while Gibson was writing this, much to his horror. And it's also reminiscent in the beginning of uh, the cantina scene in Star Wars, of course, but uh, this book is far superior to both, in my opinion. He managed to differentiate it enough from Blade Runner. So yeah, Case is sleeping in a cheap coffin hotel and recovering to what degree he can from uh, getting uh, neurally fucked up by a client he tried to swindle. So now he can't go into the matrix, right? He can't enter cyberspace where he was able to hack. He can't go into his element. He can't do his work, he can't do his job. And not only can he not do his job, he can't go to the place he loves, right? They've sabotaged him, they've fucked him over. The matrix in the book is not as sophisticated 
as the the film. It's a little lower tech. It's more like a 1980s video game with all the lights and geometric shapes, plus like DMT or something. Uh, <laughs> and this very, um, what would you call it? Yeah, this interactive virtual reality. There's a scene in the, the film Johnny Mnemonic with Keanu Reeves as well, a Gibson adaptation that was uh, based on a short story that was written before this, included in the Burning Chrome collection, I believe, that pretty much looks like what was in my head. I'll leave the link for the scene below. In his past, Case somehow caused the death of a woman who loved him named Linda, that he uh, feels tremendous guilt for, whom he has visions of from time to time, kind of like horrific VR flashbacks. In the beginning, he still doesn't know who is behind it, so Case is sought out by a woman with mirror shades surgically implanted around her eyes and with razor blades that extend out of her fingernails on demand. A loner, mercenary, gun-for-hire named Molly Millions, also known as Razor Girl. And she's working for this mysterious individual named Armitage. She's tracked Case down for a job. They want him to do some hacking for something big. In exchange, they fix up his body. Except, while doing so, they inform him after, as an insurance policy, they surgically implant um, sacks of poison in his blood veins, microscopic sacks of poison in his blood veins, that, after dissolving, if he uh, tries to fuck him over, uh, or not complete the job or something, uh, will leave him right where they found him. Unless he finishes the job, of course, in which case he will be provided with the enzyme to uh, solve the problem. What follows is an adventure that grows enormously in scope wherein Case tries to hack into increasingly tighter levels of secure entities with deep, dark, old, strange, twisted secrets. A whole host of characters are recruited for the job. A Jamaican dub-loving pilot named Malcolm provides muscle and support, piloting the tug Marcus Garvey, named after the Jamaican politician and black nationalist. He's part of this Jamaican space collective called Zion, which I think is actually similar to the Matrix film, you know, the city Zion and so on. I feel like this probably comes from... <laughs> Bill's, uh, Bill's time in Toronto as a head shop employee in the 60s. They also seek out a wild card addict named uh, Peter Riviera in Istanbul, who has a strange ability to conjure uh, realistic simulations, often intentionally making them grotesque. That's actually one of the more confusing uh, kind of narrative threads in the book. It's a travel novel to places that you've never been to, that vaguely resemble places you have, different realities and cities in the future. Yeah, it's a novel of espionage, drugs, sex, violence, and impossible to comprehend futuristic technologies. I forgot how much sex was in the book. <laughs> Molly almost uh, immediately jumps Case's bones in the coffin after they meet. I was like, whoa, I totally forgot. What Molly sees in this guy is up for interpretation, I don't know. Well, it becomes clear in the end, you know. They're, bo they're broken people with dead lovers in their past, both of them. Haunted, you know, these two, these two lovers, you know. Irreparable psychic scars, undoubtedly. Broken pretty much, spiritually broken. It's rough, it's not a happy ending, you know? Again, its origins lie in uh, like film noir detective novels. Very much of that bent. But the book remains fresh, you know? It's a fucked up conglomeration of wires, neon, panels, decks that they use to jack into the Matrix. Yes, all of that was started here, right? The Matrix, the film took a great deal from Neuromancer. Most of the, the technological stuff, I mean, the whole thing with the machines running off on their own, that was an addition, I think, to this. But this kind of poses those questions, right? AI, what does it want after it gets smart enough? What does that mean for humans? <laughs> the plot of Neuromancer is complex, but Gibson intentionally obfuscates the plot in a mishmash of terms and dialects that kind of resemble the inside of a computer or something. There's no real making sense of this. It's all kind of subject to interpretation. As in, you know, w the technology that they're using and exactly what they're doing in these programs. You can get the plot, but but it's it's... It's a mess. <laughs> Sometimes I think the plot of Gravity's Rainbow, honestly, was easier to understand than the follow the ball plot of Neuromancer. I mean, he is, it is kind of like a video game. He's shooting you, the audience, all over the screen and uh, completely just confusing you. I mean, it's not particularly complicated. Uh, there's just so, m there, there are so many switchbacks, right? We're going, you know, literally sometimes it's like changing channels in the VR, you know, like, now he's in Molly's perspective, like he's seeing through Molly's eyes, and now he's back to his perspective. He's jacking in, he's flipping, right? He's flipping here, he's flipping there, going back in the Matrix, coming out of the Matrix, like, 
what's happening in real life, what's happening in cyberspace. It's like, it's rah. It's similar in some ways to something like Alice in Wonderland. It possesses its own language, right? Slang, its own future slang, meant to be felt, you know, tonally rather than understood intellectually. And it, you know, and it's also slang that was uh, coming from Toronto in the 60s. So it's simultaneously kind of like, you know, uh, vintage and futuristic, right? Kind of mishmashed into this thing that is completely impenetrable to some degree. Not really though. Accept that you have no idea what the fuck is going on, that you will only have fragments, at least for much of the reading experience, and you will probably enjoy the ride. If you look too hard to understand it, you'll probably be disappointed. As Gibson's model for this novel doesn't withstand heavy text scrutiny, but then it wasn't supposed to. The less you know about computers and how they work, the better your experience of this novel is going to be. In this novel, this is Gibson's method for maintaining mystery. He visually describes the technology, but rarely goes into coherent instructional detail. Gibson grew up in the 50s in the era of the Cold War, immersed in an America focused on the bright and shining future, while living day to day, as we are now, with the idea of imminent nuclear holocaust. His work displays this dichotomy, right? Glossy technological advancement coating the festering rotten core of organic human reality. Permeating the entire novel is a thick fog of nauseating techno-oppression, right? The singularity came and went. The result was mixed at best. Endless advertising and synthetic experience, hordes of polluted landscapes. As Gibson has discussed, the natural and technological worlds have inverted, right? The result is nothing short of, in, in one way, horrifying. His feeling, Case's feeling, of being so tired is strikingly relatable to modern audiences here in the West. And our modern scourge of shitty street drugs that kill you doesn't help, that's for sure. In his coming of age, William Gibson read the work of another William, which would be William S. Burroughs. Had a tremendous influence on him, and you can spot it everywhere. Henry Miller, too. You can spot both of them in Newer Man's or Kerouac, too. Uh, like, uh, in the sheer speed of the thing, like on the road, right? You open up Neuromancer and after the first line, the sky above the port was the color of television tuned to a dead channel. You're traveling at 120 miles an hour and it's not over till it's over. The whole thing has the tempo of something like uh, um, the end of Tetsuo the Iron Man by Shinya Sukamoto. Another cyberpunk gem from uh, the year I was born, 89. I'll leave the scene below. Very Acura, right? A great deal of Neuromancer is the romanticization of technology an enamored perspective with futurist possibilities, a physical hellscape with a cyber ideal. That's like Gibson's calling card, the virtual world in all the depth and complexity that we long for. The reality that we live in today is less sexy, naturally, and he's admitted this much in the interview below. But, but, the Gibson possibilities remain, right? He's just faster than the collective, more perceptive and forward thinking than the collective, but he's shaped the aesthetic of our technological desires. The language Gibson has created consists of nonsensical technological fetishism, a linguistic vortex of computer hardware, mechanical descriptors, brand names, chemical compounds, drugs, and future slang. I met Mr. Gibson after uh, having a few drinks and going over to a reading of his. I asked him what on earth he was listening to when he wrote this, right? He was, he was kind enough to sign my copy too. Thank you very much, Mr. Gibson, if you're watching this. And he said he was, he was the sweetest guy, I'm telling you. Uh, I would bet money you can't find one person walking the planet Earth to say an unkind thing about William Gibson in person. His response was, uh, oh, you'd be disappointed. But I insisted, I really wanted to know. And he just said he wanted to write something that read the way that David Bowie's Diamond Dogs sounded. And I was really thrilled with that. It was very kind of him to do that after I put him on the spot, you know. The Matrix has its roots in primitive arcade games, said the voiceover, in early graphics programs and military experimentation with cranial jacks. On the Sony, a two-dimensional space war faded behind a forest of mathematically generated ferns, demonstrating the spatial possibilities of logarithmic spirals. Cold blue military footage burned through, lab animals wired into test systems, helmets feeding into fire control circuits of tanks and warplanes. Cyberspace a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators in every nation by children being taught mathematical concepts, a graphic representation of data abstracted from the banks of every computer in the human system, unthinkable complexity, lines of light ranged in the non-space of the mind, clusters and constellations of data, like city lights, receding. What's that? Molly asked as he flipped the channel selector. Kids show. 
So that's uh, that's when Case is like uh, flipping channels and comes across a kids show, right? And it's just giving a description for what the Matrix is. Clever narrative device there. It feels fresh because more than ever, we're being confronted with this social cultural dichotomy, which is always discussed regarding Neuromancer and a lot of cyberpunk, of the juxtaposition of high and low culture. That is, depictions of extreme wealth, a wealthy elite, and futuristic technology with uh, an impoverished population, vice, and crime. Extreme wealth and urban decay, all surrounded by technology. He's called Neuromancer adolescent in a positive way. He said it was a young man's book written by a man who was not so young, but sufficiently immature. Which is, I'm kind of paraphrasing there, but I thought that was funny. There's a total silliness about the drug use in the book. A kind of young adult nihilism still working under the characters, which I do enjoy. It was pretty funny. One of my favorite pastimes when I was like 16 or 17 was to put on my leather jacket, get into my car and drive around the city at night listening to Joy Division uh, or Suicide, smoking cigarettes and drinking Rockstar. This horrific beverage that tasted like uh, bitter citrus mixed with uh, gasoline. And I'd listen to Digital or Unknown Pleasures and uh, I'm not sure if I had Closer at that point, but I should have. I'd listen to Shadow Play and uh, Disorder and look at the modern world by night with the street lights and headlights and neon and buildings and rain with wipers synced up to the music. There was something so natural about the activity that I thought it was something entirely uh, unto me. It very much is not, right? I liked watching the windows of expensive hotels or office buildings or uh, new parking garage structures reflections of street lights and black puddles, red brake lights in the rain, kind of expanding into these orbs in the windshield, stuff like that. All of these textured entities of technology and accelerating capitalism flooding past at night while I thought, you know, and DJed on the stereo, constructing the soundtrack of the real life film in front of me. Kind of weird amateur real-time film composer, right? Even when I listen to that music, it always pulls me back to night. Nocturnal urban driving, right? I no longer smoke or drink Rockstar, but I do still listen to Joy Division. Had I read this book around that time, I would have realized that I was slipping into the realm of William Gibson. There was an almost archetypal world. I was inside, you know, alone. I was inhabiting a genre before I knew it was one. Having a communal experience via nicotine, caffeine, and dark depressing post-punk. And yes, that last one is very much a drug. The drug hit him like an express train, a white hot column of light mounting his spine from the region of his prostate, illuminating the sutures of his skull with x-rays of short-circuited sexual energy. His teeth sang in their individual sockets like tuning forks, each one pitch perfect and clear as ethanol. His bones beneath the hazy envelope of flesh were chromed and polished, the joints lubricated with a film of silicone. Sandstorms raged across the scoured floor of his skull, generating waves of high, thin static that broke behind his eyes, spheres of purest crystal expanding. Sounds like some pretty good molly. Ah, uh, there is a kind of two-dimensional quality to the book, certainly. Um, you know, it doesn't go very deep, it's pretty surface level. Gibson's characters remain fairly surface. They suggest deeper thoughts than are written. But Neuromancer invented an aesthetic and a genre. The novel is smart. Gibson is very, very smart. He's a really sharp guy. However, the annoying thing about Neuromancer, yeah, is its plot, for sure. It is a Pinchonian kitchen sink, follow the ball clusterfuck. Holy shit. I've read the book multiple times, looked up summaries, read them, still don't understand the damn thing. I have the basic idea, but my God, you know, the clunkiness with the strange Habsburg-like Tessier Ashpool aristocrat corporation family inbreeding, freezing themselves and then controlling the AI that's searching for his other half. Just like, man, that early 80s Toronto hash was something else, bro. It's so busy that it becomes kind of a mess and forgettable, unfortunately. He said this many times. He was frightened while writing it. He was, he was really worried that he was going to just fail, you know, and that kind of comes across in the construction of the book. Like he, like this kind of frenetic need to go for it. He was afraid of failure, so he kind of turned it to 11. And it is by far, from what I've read of him, the most uh, excessive of his books. The most kind of like outrageously busy. But yeah, essentially that becomes the plot of the story. Tessier Ashpool, this strange, eccentric, outrageously wealthy family, have created these two artificial intelligences located in different countries, Switzerland and Brazil. Turns out those two AIs become aware of each other. One's called Wintermute, the other one is called Neuromancer. They want to merge together to become a super intelligence. This isn't good for the family, we can infer, because they want them as machines. And if they merge, the AIs will go off in their direction and they will do their thing which often doesn't involve humans and may eventually be at the uh, uh, the expense of humans. 
again, we can infer. This isn't really gone into in the book. It's just kind of um, presented. They'll become emancipated. It's a liability. And I think this is actually something that one day is going to happen, which is really bizarre to think about. In fact, this may be a question down the road. I think a lot of science fiction has, has covered this territory, including, I think, The Matrix, somewhere in there. When do AIs get their freedom, right? Is that even safe to give? But with Neuromancer, whatever Neuromancer's failures with plot, the aesthetic delivery is so forward thinking and the writing so snappy and idiosyncratic, it's beyond impressive. I mean, it's just, it's just a trip. It's also a remarkably depressing book, I have to say. I was, I was kind of taken aback by that. The tone it ends on is true film noir. But the most striking thing that Gibson demonstrates in his fiction, for me, about the human condition, is that it is, it is irreparably tied in with technology, especially now. I mean, like it or not, there is no going back. This is it. This is a one-way lane. We are really not the same as our predecessors. We may not even be the same species, it might be argued, soon. God knows what comes 10 or 20 years down the line, you know? And that machine, this machine is accelerating. Wherever we're going, for better or worse, man, we are flying down that highway. The Matrix is infiltrating nature. One day they will merge. That may be what some call the singularity and you and I may be alive to see it. And like the internet, it has the possibility of being really, really, really complicated and really, really dumb at the same time. Whatever William Gibson had in his head, guaranteed it was cooler. Better than food. Absolute classic. Essential reading, in my opinion. Check it out. So you should read it. Well, if you're into William S. Burroughs, Philip K. Dick, and J.G. Ballard, don't hesitate. Pick it up. Don't hesitate. Pick it up. I still have not read Philip K. Dick, though. I need to. I've got Ubik on the shelf. Might do that first. All right. And on that note, coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for stopping by and watching the show. I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon, I place the names in this mason jar, and for every review, I pull out a name, and whoever's name I pull out is sent a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee, roast by yours truly. Currently, the coffee is from Nicaragua, and it's fantastic. I really love it. If you would like to help support the show and get in on that, then you can click on the link below, or go to patreon.com forward slash books of better than food, and the tiers start at $5 or more per video, and I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much. As the tiers go up, you get more stuff, so please check it out. And I'm happy to take suggestions for, uh, uh, things to add to tears, you know, always open to that. And just for signing up, you will get access to the Sexual Personae series, wherein I am covering every single chapter of Camille Paglia's Sexual Personae. There's also a Discord for that as well. And as a patron, you will get access to all of these reviews ad-free, and early, I might add, by a day or so, as well as the patron-only reviews, the Discord channel, the regular one, and the uh, one for Sexual Personae, as well as the Better Than Friday newsletter that I send out every Friday, which is just a list of five different things that I'm interested in at any given time, usually some combination of books, articles, music, and films. And if you're looking for new stuff to watch, read, or listen to, and you think we have similar taste, I think you'll really enjoy that. Thank you very much, all my patrons, and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Oh, and international shipping is included. Graham. Graham M. Thank you very much, Graham. Really appreciate it. You're going to receive William Gibson's Neuromancer, plus a bag of coffee, roast by yours truly, and hope you love both. Cheers. Well, that's all I've got for you today. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, yeah, essential reading, like I said. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this, and always remember, bring a book wherever you go. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a good night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.